When most people think of mafia, they usually think of prohibition era gangsters with their trench coats and tommy guns, or maybe the raspy voice of Marlon Brando's godfather. Most believe that the mafia was destroyed by prosecutors like Rudy Giuliani in the 1980s and 90s, and that it no longer really exists outside of places like South America and Eastern Europe. Most believe that the mafia does not exist in the so-called civilized Western world. But what if I were to tell you that mafia actually rules the entire world? And what if I were to tell you that there are actually many levels of mafia that most are not aware of, and that sophisticated mafia bosses actually puppet the world's highest political structures, often in plain sight? Because when most people think of the mafia, they think of Goodfellas and the Godfather, and hence are thinking only of the middle tier of gangsters. There are actually six levels of mafia that this video will discuss in detail. The family patriarchs of the Godfather may have run New York City, but in the real world, the highest levels of mafia have immense power over entire nations and global geopolitics. But first, let's take a moment to think about what the mafia really is. Mafias are defined by a few key features. Number one, a mafia is an organized body of criminals, often with international connections. Number two, a mafia operates with a complex, ruthless, and Machiavellian behavioral code. Number three, a mafia exerts hidden and sinister influence to advance their own interests over their chosen territory. So with that, let's expose the six levels of mafia, starting from the very lowest and then moving up towards the men who control the world itself. Level one, street thugs. The first level is rather boring and obvious, and this would be run-of-the-mill street thugs and drug dealers. Some would argue that they aren't powerful enough to be considered mafia. However, even at this level, they still exhibit many features of mafia, albeit on a very small scale. These criminals will be loosely organized into a group of a few thugs that control one or two streets. They will use force to control the drug dealing and petty crime that occurs on their turf. And among themselves, they will attempt to manipulate, maneuver, and fight for power amongst each other even if it is for a very small territory and for a very small amount of money and also over status that most outsiders would never bother to care about. The next level would be neighborhood gang leaders. Think of the Crips and Bloods, who controlled many neighborhoods in Los Angeles and often went to war with one another in deadly shootouts. This also includes motorcycle gangs like the Hells Angels and the Banditos. In 2015, Hundreds of bikers were involved in a massive shootout in Waco, Texas, showing that biker gangs are still quite active and powerful, even in the modern era. The leaders of these gangs are definitely more sophisticated than just run-of-the-mill street thugs, and as such, control much larger territories and have more soldiers under their control. This allows them to pull off much bigger crimes, like large-scale robberies and scams, and also traffic drugs on a much larger scale. However, though these gang leaders certainly have more money than ordinary petty criminals and certainly have a lot more muscle under their control, their influence over local governments and institutions is quite limited, which puts a hard cap on their overall power. Level 3, Godfathers. The next level is where things get really interesting. This next level is what most people think of when they think of the Mafia. Vito and Michael Corleone could be thought of as very successful members of this class of criminal. In our own world, during the Prohibition era, the most famous was of course Al Capone and his associates. In more recent history, examples of this would include men like John Gotti and Frank Lucas, who was immortalized in the film American Gangster, as well as men like Sammy the Bull Gravano and Michael Francie, who are now famous because of valuetainment documentaries by Patrick Bet David. Most Latin American narcos can also be thought to belong to this level as well. Level 3 mafias are differentiated from the lower levels by their greater degree of sophistication, organization, wealth, and influence. They have a distinct organizational hierarchy, with soldiers and associates at the lower rungs, who are organized into crews under capo regimes, or captains, who then report to the underboss, who then reports to the godfather. They made money through various illegal business activities, such as gambling, racketeering, prostitution, drugs, and extortion, and were also known to often diversify into legitimate businesses as well. 
Because they were able to generate serious amounts of wealth from these activities, they were often able to buy favor and protection from local officials and police. However, unlike the corporate oligarchs at the highest levels, they weren't able to buy off the most prominent officials at the state and federal levels, which is why a young Rudy Giuliani was able to go to war against the five families of New York and win. However, Giuliani was later destroyed when he tried to take on the mafia who occupied the politician and oligarch classes, which shows how incredibly powerful they are. So in summary, level three gangsters are very wealthy, powerful, smart, and ruthless, and much of their glamorized Hollywood mystique actually has roots in reality. However, as intimidating and fearsome as they are, there are actually three more levels of mafia above them. Now, one of my favorite scenes in the Godfather trilogy is the last dialogue between Don Vito Corleone and his son, who is now the new Godfather, during which Vito mentors his son and gives him advice. Vito Corleone is one of my favorite characters in all of cinema history, and Marlon Brando does an incredible job of portraying his cunning, ruthlessness, and wisdom. I never, I never wanted this for you. I worked my whole life. I don't apologize to take care of my family. And I refused to be a fool. Dancing on the string held by all those big shots. There are two ideas that he conveys in this scene that are extremely insightful. First is the idea that he never wanted to be a puppet on strings. That is, he never wanted to be manipulated by more powerful men. He was the one who wanted to be doing the manipulating. Don Corleone was born very poor in a foreign land, but he was blessed with a strategic and astute mind. So while most immigrants around him were oblivious to the power dynamics of the wider world, Don Corleone quickly realized that there was a hierarchy of powerful men who often operate in the shadows and hold the true power in society, and that the vast majority of people were merely their pawns. At an early age, Vito vowed to never allow himself or his sons to ever be pawns of this system. I don't apologize, that's my life, but I thought that... But when it was your time that... that you would be the one to hold the strings. Senator Corleone. Governor Corleone, something. I'm not a Pesinovanta. Second, you can see how much Vito laments that he had bigger aspirations for Michael. His dream was for Michael to become a senator or a governor, a politician with legitimate power. Vito is certainly very perceptive and understood the nature of power and the complexities of how the world really works. He knew that even though underworld bosses are very powerful and could potentially rise to control an entire city, he also knew that because their businesses involved actually doing the dirty work of running illegal businesses, there was very much a limit to the potential power and prestige a mob boss could ultimately obtain. He wanted his son to reach the next level of power, which brings us to the next chapter. Level 4, Corrupt Politicians and High-Level Government Officials. Do you know how naive you sound? Why? Senators and presidents don't have men killed. Who's being naive, Kay? Now, this is where things are going to get very interesting and controversial. And as I move on, I also want to emphasize that not all politicians and government officials are morally dubious. And even in this crazy modern world, there are still a few honest and well-intentioned politicians and government officials who actually want the best for their constituents. However, especially as you study the higher levels of government, you begin to realize why the stereotype of the crooked, lying, and greedy politician exists all around the world, in every single nation, across every single culture. According to Business Insider, Democratic Congresswoman Susie Lee skipped reporting on 200 trades worth over three million bucks. Republican Diana Harshbarger failed to report 700 trades worth over $10 million. And what's the penalty for failing to report these purchases? It's a joke. It's as low as $200. And sadly, I think it is obvious to most people who are paying attention in the United States that the corrupt politicians and officials in both major parties have long come to outnumber the honest and benevolent ones. And this tangled mess of corrupt, greedy, and unethical politicians and officials has come to be known by many names, such as the Swamp, or the Establishment, 
or the Big Brother government. Thus, the fourth level of mafia actually consists of corrupt politicians and other non-elected government leaders, such as the high-ranking bureaucrats in the alphabet agencies. In fact, in Southeast China, there's a Cantonese expression that refers to high-ranking law enforcement officials as yao pai langzai, which basically means gangsters with badges. There are those who tried their best to expose the multitude of nefarious actions of the all-powerful alphabet agencies and have either ended up in permanent exile or imprisoned. It is not a secret that the world of politics is dirty, ruthless, and manipulative, especially at the federal level. But how did this come to be? I would argue that it is because Machiavellianism generates a self-reinforcing culture. The power and wealth that is inevitably intertwined with the political system is bound to attract unscrupulous and dishonorable individuals over time. And once a few bad apples get into the system, it attracts more of the same. And also, others who previously heeded ethical boundaries are forced to become more ruthless to compete with them. Before long, once there are enough corrupt people in power, ordinary and honest patriotic citizens who are concerned about their country could never survive among all the sharks in the nation's capital. And while a patriotic and ethical individual who earns a position in Congress, the governor's office, or even the presidency can wield their massive influence and power to advance the prosperity of their nation, an unethical leader can easily use that power for their own selfish aims. While conventional mob bosses may have a few dozen soldiers operating below them, corrupt politicians can wield influence over entire law enforcement and intelligence agencies, and at the highest levels of government, can even wield the devastating power of the entire United States military. A New York City godfather could use his contingent of soldiers to wreck an entire neighborhood if he chose. However, government leaders can wreck an entire country with their military. When the rulers of Iraq and Libya deviated too far from the will of the United States, specifically with attempts to break away from the United States financial system by selling oil and other currencies, they both met the same fate and were annihilated. Theoretically, political leaders are supposed to be humble public servants. And in the early stages of the United States, this was largely the case. However, in the modern era of the United States, career politicians often reach net worths far exceeding those of actual mob bosses. At least in the United States, the powerful politicians of both parties receive millions of dollars from corporate lobbyists to fund their campaigns, are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to give short speeches to hedge funds and Wall Street banks, launch taxpayer money through offshore shell corporations, and are often given cushy and lucrative jobs in the private sector after their tenures in office. These are all examples of everyday corruption in modern politics. It is obvious that the vast sums of money given to the politicians by big businesses come with their own strings attached, and this system of course leads to nepotism, cronyism, and political favors being done for the corporate oligarchs who provide the money. In previous eras, it was considered highly unethical for any government leader to accept large gifts that could sway their judgment. But in modern politics, it is simply referred to as lobbying. And in the United States, this involved $3.7 billion of donations in 2021 alone. Thus, it leads you to wonder whether the politicians and leaders are executing the will of the people, or whether they are mainly doing the bidding of their wealthy masters, who occupy the next level of mafia above them. You got 90% of the American public out there with little or no net worth. I create nothing. I own. We make the rules, pal. When I was studying civics in middle school and high school, I used to believe that the elected officials of the United States represented the highest levels of power and responsibility, and that the politicians were ultimately the ones in charge of the nation. It was only through acquiring greater life experience and my own self-directed studies that I came to understand that I was actually very naive when I was younger, and that American power politics are actually tightly intertwined with big business and the financial system, and thus much more complex than presented in the textbooks. It is common knowledge that powerful and ethically dubious businessmen have huge sway over politics in places like Eastern Europe, where they are specifically known as oligarchs. However, only a small portion of the American population realizes that the same thing also happens in the so-called free Western world, albeit in a more sophisticated and polished fashion. 
In Eastern Europe, they call them oligarchs. But in the United States, we call them by other names. The military industrial complex, Wall Street, Big Pharma, Big Agriculture, Corporate Media, Big Tech. These are but a few examples. President Eisenhower specifically warned about the rising and dangerous power of the military industrial complex during his farewell address in 1961, though the problem has vastly expanded since his time. A more accurate modern term would probably be the military, industrial, banking, media, and big tech complex, though that still would not encompass all of the exorbitantly rich players involved in the game of American politics. Some people may dispute that I have ranked the wealthy financial interests above the actual politicians. And yes, I must agree that the American political machinery is extremely complex, and every politician, CEO, and billionaire will have varying degrees of influence and power in different situations and within different sectors. However, if you step back and look at it from the simplest perspective, due to the current system of lobbying and campaign financing, the politicians are essentially on the payroll of the oligarchs, which in general makes the oligarchs more powerful. And of course, just like with politicians, there are definitely at least some billionaires who are honorable people who are worthy of respect. However, in terms of character, there is a full spectrum when it comes to the oligarch class. And at the other far end of this spectrum, there are billionaires and CEOs who are far more ruthless than even Don Corleone, and even more powerful. And thus, at this level, they don't even need guns or hitmen, and can rely entirely on their massive wealth media influence and political connections yeah so who's, i mean who's in power then who's in power and what why would they want to spark civil war okay professional criminals are in power and professional criminals are in power who want to stay in power forever and they know that they can only keep their uh you know i mean they're serial financial criminals you can only loot a population so much until they realize there's nothing left and they're going to start asking questions where's my money of course throughout american history there have been daring presidents who have gone to war against the oligarchy in an attempt to rise above them into the sixth level of power. President Andrew Jackson was a successful example of this. He had a personal loathing for the Wall Street bankers of his era, and he was actually successful in preventing the formation of the second central bank during his tenure, which would have become the equivalent of the modern Federal Reserve. President Jackson was successful in defying the powerful moneyed interests of his time for a few reasons. First, because he had incredible force of personality and strength of character. Second, the corporations of his era were not as powerful or omnipotent as those of today. Third, the only media that existed during his era were newspapers, and there were still hundreds of independent newspapers that existed during his time, whereas today, all forms of mainstream media are now controlled by only six mega conglomerates, a consolidation of media power not too different from those of the authoritarian regimes of the near past. In 1835, an attempt was made to assassinate President Jackson, but in a seeming act of providence, the would-be assassin had misfires with two different pistols, and Andrew Jackson subsequently rushed him and started beating him with his cane. And thus, the Secret Service actually had to restrain President Jackson and ironically protect the assassin from the president. Unfortunately, President Jackson's Herculean efforts only delayed the inevitable, and the Federal Reserve was established in 1913. Later, the US dollar was taken completely off the gold standard in 1971. Thus, in the modern era, the Federal Reserve is made up of 12 private banks, operates autonomously from Congress, and has the ability to print an infinite supply of money that isn't backed by any tangible assets. In the United States, prior to the establishment of the Fed, the average inflation rate was less than half a percent. However, since the Fed was established, the dollar has lost more than 95% of its value, and currently, the inflation rate is at a 40-year high due to the rampant and excessive quantitative easing that took place during 2020 and 2021. This, of course, predominantly benefits the wealthiest of society whom own the majority of the assets and disproportionately hurts the working class. Sadly, in the 1960s, there was another great president who tried to openly defy the corporate and financial interests of the nation. He opposed the Vietnam War and also wished to put the US dollar back on a precious metal standard and even sign an executive order to begin the production of silver-backed notes. By these brazen actions, he made far too many powerful enemies in various places, and tragically, he was killed soon afterwards. The fact that his brother and son were also later killed is yet additional evidence of the utter ruthlessness of the level five and six mafia. 
However, in the modern era, the situation has gotten much worse since the 1960s, and there's a strong argument to be made that modern America has perhaps become a corporate oligarchy and kleptocracy, and is no longer an honorable and peaceful republic, as our wise founding fathers had intended. Now, you're not naive enough to think we're living in a democracy, are you, buddy? Level 6. Autocrats and Old Aristocracy The sixth level is the highest level of power and influence in the world, and is predominantly composed of the most powerful and cunning oligarchs in history who have managed to fortify their wealth and influence to construct independent empires, aristocracies, and power structures that last for generations, and sometimes even for centuries. In the United States, the Rockefeller dynasty could perhaps be considered one such example. Another prime example of a level 6 power structure would be BlackRock, a powerful investment corporation with almost $10 trillion of assets under management, controlling an unimaginable pool of capital drawn from institutional and private investors across the entire globe. And by dictating where this capital flows, they wield the power to make or break entire industries. To put this into perspective, the annual GDP of the entire nation of Austria is less than half a trillion dollars. BlackRock owns substantial percentages of hundreds of major corporations in the S&P 500 across every sector of the American economy. We're talking millions of shares of each of the most powerful companies in the world, including Microsoft, Amazon, Exxon, JP Morgan, Disney, and Raytheon, just to name but a few. And yes, this means that a single corporation exerts massive influence over every major sector of Western civilization, including big tech, big oil, Wall Street, military, aerospace, mainstream media, and pharmaceuticals. The far-reaching influence of such multinational investment corporations partially explains why various ostensibly competing companies often push coordinated agendas and narratives and almost behave like massive corporate cartels. Overall, companies like BlackRock represent a very concerning centralization of both financial and political power. In certain nations outside the West, the political leaders actually hold more power than the billionaire oligarch class due to their disparate political structures. Now, please keep in mind that this is not necessarily a value judgment regarding Western versus Eastern empires, but simply a discussion of relative power levels and influence. This president is the leader of the most rapidly growing empire on Earth, and is an example of a man at the sixth level of power, since in his government system, high-ranking party officials hold greater power than even the billionaires, and can even make them disappear if they fall out of line. Another example is the president of Russia, who openly went to war with the powerful oligarchs who had taken control of Russia after the fall of the USSR, and through a combination of ruthlessness, cunning, and strategy, was able to outmaneuver and defeat them all. This resulted in several Russian oligarchs killed, exiled, or imprisoned, and the remaining ones had to either bow down to him or be annihilated. And thus, in the Russian Federation, the president actually puppets the oligarchs. Another example would be the Saudi royal family, led by the mysterious and calculating Crown Prince bin Salman. The House of Saud is a modern-day monarchy that is exorbitantly wealthy from their nation's oil production, with a combined net worth conservatively estimated to be in excess of $1.4 trillion. And for all intents and purposes, their family rules their nation with unrivaled power. Furthermore, by being the world's largest petroleum producer, single-handedly supplying 13-14% to of the world's oil, they wield massive influence over the global economy and essentially have the power to make or break the American dollar. In a similar vein, the monarchs and great rulers of historical empires could also be considered to belong to this class of power and influence, and famous examples include Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, the Qin Emperor, and Napoleon Bonaparte. It is important to note that such monarchs were men of their own time, and while men like Genghis Khan would be considered utterly brutal across all eras, men like Theodoric the Great and Alexander the Great were generally considered to be very heroic rulers during their day. Of course, King Alexander was not without his flaws, but no historian could question his superhuman courage, his strategic genius, or his devotion and loyalty to his men. Furthermore, he also lived by his own strict code of honor and always led his armies from the front. It is quite obvious that such traits are utterly lacking in the oligarchs and bureaucrats who now rule over the declining American empire. Make of that what you will. 
In closing, I must emphasize that I did not intend for this video to promote nihilism, nor to endorse any particular political agenda. My only goal with this video was to awaken and educate others on how power and politics actually works, so that people can have a more realistic comprehension of the power structures around them, and thus resist the manipulations of the system. My hope is that such education can eventually create a strong foundation for positive change. Obviously, when you begin to examine the American political system from this perspective, you realize that it has become such a complicated mess that there exists no simple solutions for reform. And unfortunately, unlike in a Marvel or Star Wars movie, there isn't just one supervillain or Sith Lord at the very top who controls everything and needs to be removed from power. Our world is a lot more complicated and is actually controlled by thousands of very powerful, rich, and cunning individuals, all vying amongst themselves for even more wealth and power. And they view the common people as nothing more than expendable pawns or resources to be milked. Thus, it can be said that in the real world, it is the entire corrupt system that is the supervillain. And indeed, if human civilization continues down this dark path, it is very possible that the world could eventually become a thousand year prison. Sadly, I don't believe that a simple political solution exists for a system that is so hopelessly broken, and over time, I have come to believe that the answer is most likely spiritual, artistic, and cultural, and not political. Perhaps it may sound too nebulous and idealistic for some, but I believe that in order to overcome the global mafia system, there needs to be an evolution in human consciousness. Know that if you have watched this far, you are probably a light worker and a divergent thinker, a more mature soul with the ability to discern the deceptions and illusions of this reality. As such, in many ways, it is part of your divine duty to share and teach what you know with others, to help awaken and educate those around you. Though the global mafia wields trillions of dollars of wealth, immense political power, and media influence, never forget that they are less than 0.01% of the population. If ordinary people are actually able to awaken and unite, and actually gather the courage to speak up for their sacred freedoms, then there is really nothing that can stop them. Never forget that your voice has immense spiritual power over this reality, a power that has been alluded to in every major holy scripture across the world, including the Bible, the Quran, and the Vedas. However, the world rulers across every era of human history have always known that the masses are easily manipulated and can be divided against each other with little effort and over the pettiest of differences. And perhaps it is easier now than ever with centralized mainstream media and their mastery over propaganda. Only time will tell if enough people are able to awaken from the programming in the current era. That being said, at the very least, even if the system itself is not able to be meaningfully reformed or changed, it is crucial for you to continuously educate yourself so that you are able to win freedom and sovereignty from the control system, both for yourself and for your family. Never forget that this situation has very real stakes. It is a struggle not merely for your own comfort, but for nothing less than the freedom of your children and grandchildren. Of course, the subject of achieving individual sovereignty in an increasingly oppressive and tyrannical world is a huge topic and one that I am very passionate about. Thus, it is a topic that will require multiple videos to cover, which I hopefully will create for you in the future. Thank you for watching, everyone. If you made it to the end of the video, I'd appreciate if you subscribed and left a comment regarding your own ideas on how to improve the freedoms and liberties of human civilization. Take care until the next video.